I'm hoping my buddy comes out. The young handicapped guy right here. What's up, Jason? And he usually comes out, gets his mail. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? <laughs> no! All right, is that good? All right, you got it, Jason. Have a good day, bud. Be careful. You know, you can't get in the box or anything, so I'll usually, I'll hold his mail for him, and they'll come out, and I'll give him his mail. I mean, you just befriend these people. They're like family today. So I see them coming up, I'll just grab their mail or something like that. They get things like clockwork, like their medicine, their checks, you know? So you know when that's coming, and they know. Some customers get that special attention. Seatbelt on. It's part of the job. When it gets to that point, too, it's not even like a job, you know? It's just like a normal family thing that you're doing with them, you know, for them. You can leave a letter on your door, and it will be hand-delivered to a spot thousands of miles away in the most remote corner of the United States. It's just really great. I mean, I don't think there's a bigger bargain in the world these days. That's a miracle right there. It takes three or four of those to get my normal cup of coffee. But you can get this letter anywhere in the world, and, and you trust it's going to go there. The Postal Service delivers 155 billion pieces of mail every year, approximately 40% of the world's mail. You can actually see the people that you're touching, and I'm a people person, so it gives me a good feeling. You doing all right? Yeah. Good. Good. We come here for the news, we come here for our mail, for the kids to play. I mean, this is just kind of our social point of um, Evanston. It's the post office, and you know the postmaster. If there are clerks there, you know them. You know they're there to serve you. They see each other. They get to talk about things that are happening and what they need to get involved in in town. It can be politics. It can be a bond issue. It can be that there's a forest fire two miles down the road coming your way. Each place is composed of different people, and every, everybody's got a story to tell. So the post office is kind of a window on the world. You look forward to it. <laughs> Take care. It's a nice interlude. Hi, Jack. How are things? And a little bit of information about the neighborhood and the community. Take this picture. <laughs> a real life spice in the community. The first thing I learned when I came to the Postal Service was three words the sanctity of the mail. I'm Jay, and this is my dad. Right now, we're in front of the Maple Crest Station in Maplewood, New Jersey. My job was box clerk, window clerk, and I spent many wonderful years here taking care of beautiful customers. He always had a lot to say about his job at the post office. I felt a feeling of accomplishment every day I came home from work. I love the attitude of those that work here. They're very personal, they give you good advice, like we just got it today. I like to help people, and I care about them, and I want to give them the best service and most knowledgeable service that I could. After hearing the stories for 27 years and watching what he went through to keep his job, I set out to uncover if what happened to him was happening everywhere. I loved my job when I went to work at the post office. It was a tough job. A lot of the jobs were playing out around here at the time. Uh, I worked in the textile industry, and the mill I was working at was closing down. When I started at the post office, I was 27 years old with two children, and I had three jobs working at the mall. 
They were all minimum wage jobs, and there's no way I could support my children. I couldn't have found a better job. You know, the money was great, the hours. It was just a great place to work. But as time went on, I had never been messed with in my whole career to after I turned 51 with so many years in. And it's almost like they'd had their usefulness out of me and it was time for me to go. Don't talk to nobody. Deliver the mail as fast as you can. Cut the lawns. Climb over somebody's bushes. They, would, they actually told you that. They're trying to get you to speed up and, if anything, get you to break safety measures. But they won't tell you that. It's big time stress. I gotta do everything right. If I do one thing wrong, the 99 things I did are, are negated. My chest was a pumping and my head was about to pop. It's like a mutual distrust. <laughs> you know, the, the employees don't trust the supervisors, managers, and the managers don't trust the workers. It's a, basically a war zone. You're on one side and they're on the other. The system right now is the postal service operates. It's counterproductive. In many places, it's a, it's a day to day battle. I was told by several postmasters and supervisors throughout my career, I will follow you till I catch you do something wrong. In this postal culture, you're the enemy if you speak up. We'll find a way to get at you for opening your mouth. I worry about someone going postal. This is not an option for me, but what about someone that has put their life into the post office? What if they find themselves in Brian's crosshairs, see nowhere out, no way out, and decide to fire back? What if I'm at work that day and get caught in the crossfire? I warned them. I, I put it in writing, and I sent it to the EEO investigator, and, and I, know, I know that somebody took notice because the EEO investigator sent it to Charlotte who sent a guy down to interview me for an hour to make sure that, to make sure that I wasn't contemplating something that... Uh... The district manager was having a, um, it was a town hall meeting. I told him, I says, we're giving you this paper, this petition, because we don't want to sit around and watch TV at the 11 o'clock news and something crazy happens in the post office, and we look at the TV and see you guys on there saying we didn't know anything was wrong. So we're putting you on notice that we have a problem. And then, of course, we have this disaster Tuesday morning where Steve Spencer um, committed suicide in the bathroom of the annex. I was totally shocked. We had no one. We, we didn't have anybody to talk to the carriers. We sent two people to the hospital after that. It's, it's just a tragedy that they had to work through that. Steve was, he was this happy face. He was this happy face that you'd see in the morning, this friendly guy. He didn't have any problems, not on the outside. Steve was a straight up fella. He always willing to take the lead in, in all the things that the union and, and the postal service did for the community. He, he was a, a tireless worker. There would be postal management supervisors uh, that would be coming out and following Steve. At first, it was just uh, every once in a while, but the last three months that he was uh, alive, it had gotten to be um, three, four times a week. You're taking your lunch break. You see them pass by or pull into the place you're at and stop and look and look at their watch. And 
uh, get out and check, see if your vehicle's locked, and look in it, knowing all the time that you're watching them. And then, then they move on. And that's, to me, that's harassment. I believe they were following him to shake Steve up. Hopefully they would find him doing something they could uh, dismiss him for, that they could fire him for. But they can never do that. And I think that's why they followed him for so long. Steve would be the kind of, he would have been the kind of guy that would would be a sacrificial lamb to make things right for everybody else. He was just that good hearted. Steve Spencer was my secretary when I was president. The thing that I was shocked about is why Steve didn't come to somebody for help, because everybody used to go to Steve for help. Being real honest, which if it wasn't for Steve a lot of days, I probably could have done something wrong to people. Even the president of the union would come to him for advice because they knew, well, everyone knew, the postal management knew, uh, the union members, old and new, knew that he had so much knowledge. And I think that's where part of the problem came in. They were truly afraid of him. He was the one that they were determined to see leave the Postal Service. I wasn't surprised at what happened last week, because I've seen it coming. There's, there's going to be a lot more coming, too, if if it don't stop. You could cut the stress level walking into the building. I think people feel like their jobs are on the line. I think they feel like that if they say something that they're gonna be after them. They're gonna find things to go after them for. They're gonna find things to try to get them out. When we were voicing our opinions about what this guy's saying and doing, the poom interviewed six people. All six people said, I feel my blood pressure coming up when I see this manager. The hair on my arm stands up. I get nervous. I get tense. I said, what's your definition of going postal? And when I said that to Majid, he th threw himself back into the computer. The girl that was taking notes drops her pen. And he says, we don't like to talk about going postal. I said, OK, well, then let's change the word. You tell me what the word is that we'd use instead of going postal. He says, no, you know, I don't want to talk about going postal. They don't want to talk about that. We need um, an ambulance. Where are you at? On August 18th, 1983, Perry Smith carried a 12-gauge shotgun to the post office where he worked for 25 years. He chased the postmaster to a nearby store and killed him, shooting two former co-workers in the process. Less than four months later, it happened again in Alabama, then Georgia, and New York City. For more than two decades, it kept happening. Postal employees came to work aiming for their bosses, leaving a wake of collateral damage as dozens of postal workers were killed or injured. Oh my God, you're going to die. We had a 9mm pistol, and he started a... In Montclair, New Jersey, there were two postal employees killed, two people from the general public, and one maimed for life. I went and sat outside that office that night and had tears in my eyes because I wondered if I should go back to work because of the fact that this could happen to me. But it could happen to anybody in any walk of life, and I had too much to give up to leave the Postal Service. 
Every incident of post office violence back then, I was involved in. I was called in. Dr. Mike Mantell, an expert in dealing with mass trauma, arrived today. I remember talking about how quickly they cleaned up the blood and the bullet holes, and how some of the post office workers said, there's still some bullet holes in the wall, and it turns our stomach, and it turns, twists our minds, and it affects us deeply. And it was, just get back to work. Don't worry about it, get over it. Don't just take a file cabinet and move it over to cover a bullet hole, clean it up. I've seen a lot of people that are waiting to explode in there. Delay this at uh, labor management relations, delay it at uh, stress, uh, I, I just don't think is, is legitimate. This time it's Royal Oak, Michigan, another postal worker gone berserk on a shooting rampage targeting his supervisor. He came in at about 8 o'clock and had his gun under his coat. He shot Chris Carlisle in the head five times, came out, shot two other supervisors, and went upstairs and I guess he shot some people who were injury comp and somebody jumped out of a window. Incredibly, everyone at Royal Oak knew it was coming and most knew the gunman by name. Tom McIlvain was their main target. They went after the guy for everything. They went after him because his shorts weren't the right length, that uh, he went to the bathroom too many times. The day that he was actually fired and it stuck, three management people got in a car and followed him out to his route. They were following, like, within inches of his bumper. And that then he slowed down to, you know, 10 or 15 miles an hour. They said that he tried to hit them with, you know, slam on the brakes and make them hit him. What it came down to was that he would not submit to them. And so when I came to San Francisco, I was just shocked that the manager there was the same kind of manager that I had seen in Royal Oak. You know, barking at everybody, screaming at them, you know, scream from across the room for you to come to her desk so she could yell at you in front of everybody in the, in the place. It was frightening to me to be in there. And the times that I went to the postmaster in San Francisco and personally asked, what can we do? Because the morale is so bad that I can see how another Royal Oak will happen here. And the response always was to me, well, geez, Audrey, you seem to have some kind of personal problems. Have you thought about seeing a psychiatrist? A postal supervisor he appears to have been killed by a co-worker who later turned the gun on himself. Postal employees were told not to comment. Uh, specifics to discipline or any of that information were not going to release. Uh, both of these employees were very well liked. They didn't have any idea. No one could possibly know why he did it. How can that be that you just have the same situation so many times over and over? How can that possibly be? It has to be the mentality of the post office. This is a philosophy that's being promoted by the post office in general. Harass, intimidate, and we're here to say stop the harassment. Stop the abuse. Chop Stewart is the union person in the uh, local post office that takes care of any problems with management and any of the other employees. It's just a part of my makeup that I cannot see another human being being either verbally harassed or dehumanized in earshot of me without me getting up and trying to assist them. You just see the injustice and you say, you know what, I'm either gonna go nuts or I'm gonna go do something about it. That's one of the things that made me a steward. 
invariably you'll find that the stewards were people that grew up standing in between a bully and somebody who either couldn't or wouldn't defend himself. I am not an individual that likes to fight. I like to sit down and negotiate. But if I'm backed into the corner, I'll come out swinging with both arms because I believe in human rights and I believe in fairness and I believe in morality. There's always some type of retaliation whenever you get a really good settlement. Whenever you, as, as, as I would say, just nail them once, they want to come back and get you. But it's just business. It's not supposed to get personal. As a shop steward, my dad had an adversarial relationship with many of the bosses. Around the dinner table, I'd hear stories like this one. After he had lost a large arbitration and grievance with me, and he took me outside on my 45th birthday without any, without any earshot of anyone else and say, I may fire you for no reason at all, and you'll be on the outside looking in for six months to a year until you get to arbitration. In uh, 1997, local management had postal inspectors following me and filming me on a uh, daily basis. They accused me of stealing $500 over a 10-year period and put me out of work. At this time, I understand Bob is suspended without pay pending the outcome of a criminal investigation regarding mileage expense reports. It was the spring of my senior year, and the future was suddenly uncertain. In the federal sector, and especially in the Postal Service, they have this incredible maze of how to resolve problems. It's totally designed to take as long as possible. These are all my mileage vouchers for 10 years, which were, only came to two miles a day, seven miles, wh wherever I went that they had asked me to go. Plus the letters, hundreds and hundreds of letters from customers that I've serviced over the years, and I never had a financial shortage. I never took anything from the Postal Service. In U.S. workplaces, you're presumed guilty until proven innocent. Workers are routinely fired, suspended, held out, starved, uh, and it is a disciplining tool on the part of management. Most working class people can't sustain, uh, you know, a single paycheck, much less several months of waiting for a grievance case to be heard by an arbitrator or through a grievance panel. There's always a fear you're not going to get the job back, and many people give up and take to punishment, as I've known single mothers and single fathers that had to feed their families and took the deal and made it look like they were guilty of something they never did. So what, what you're actually going to do, you're going to fuck around and get fired. They can fire me for asking questions. What are you trying to figure out? You're going to fuck around and get fired. What are you trying to figure out? Now, the union will get you your job back, but in the meantime, you're going to be hurt. Why, why would they, they, they fire you're me? You're going to be fired. What are you trying to do? Though? He's trying to stir some more shit. No. Well, yeah, I had one manager of many offices. He told me the best way to do it, to take care of your employees is to get, find your best employee and find something he's doing wrong and give him a letter of warning. And I would say to myself, why in the world would I want to do that? Well, they figured that if you wrote up your best employee, then the other employees would fall in line thinking, well, they just wrote up the best guy in the office for some minor little detail. You know, they want to intimidate everybody. Sir, the working environment in the Postal Service is combative now. We're getting warning letters with our checks. The current atmosphere out there is one largely of fear and intimidation. We work, many of us are working six days a week, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, because we're very dedicated. However, when you do that, you're still told, you failed, you failed, you failed. And the answer to everything is discipline. Disciplining your employees or you'll be disciplined. There's a ton of pressure 
but that's, there's no reason why people should threaten people or treat them poorly. That message will go out with my next we're supposed to treat people fairly and treat people with dignity and respect. Now, if you say one thing, but you promote somebody who does completely the opposite, then what do you, what do you, what do you say? I've had particular managers who I've received hundreds of complaints on. I've had to go out to the post office. I've had to sit down and have a come to Jesus meeting with that manager about what their responsibility is and, and how they should be treating their workers. You know, when a United States congressman walks into the post office and, and reams out the manager, you know, you get a response. I mean, that's, it's, it's unfortunate that that has to happen, but, you know, sometimes that has to happen. If you have a disagreement with a boss, you might be suspended. Uh, you might be called in for an investigative interview. You will see um, audit teams miraculously showing up at your door you know, at 5 o'clock in the morning to look through your records. You didn't initial one little block of 47 blocks. All of a sudden, you're, you're being disciplined. I was told to lay off, back off. You don't want something to happen to you. If you go to a post office and they have 60 routes, they'll probably have enough personnel to operate 46 routes. They'll probably have enough vehicles for 43 routes and they'll be short on everything they need to run that office. In that respect, it's hostile on its own. Every little delivery number, um, you are answerable for every single day in your post office. You know, like I say, on any given day on the street, it's not the same day. It's a different 24 hours. Management doesn't allow for that because they're so focused on the binary code off the, off the numbers from the craft all the way up to the top management, they're under a lot of pressure and stress and computer programs that follow you around all day. I mean, we know what everyone is doing. You would get an email or your boss would call you up and they would say, get the carriers back by five or, or else. One of the managers of post office operations was calling the post offices, telling them, I told you guys no overtime this week, fix it. So, you know, they're, they're, they're being told to lie, cheat, and steal. It's tough not to break some kind of rule or, or law or something in a, in a year when you're managing a post office because they just don't give you what you need to operate it. I had gotten curious about why some of my pay and my overtime wasn't paid to me. I would go in in the morning, I would swipe my badge, I would go case my route, and I would work that way until I went home and I'd swipe off. Well, what they were doing, they were going in and actually deleting my badge swipe time. Unfortunately, supervisors will take the carrier's time and change it to $16.99 so that they're back by $1,700. Just don't get caught. Because if you get caught, then it's going to be you, not me. If something's going on, are you doing something to me that you shouldn't be doing? I'm going to check into it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to look through the contract. I'm going to look through the employee labor manual. I'm going to the CFR. I'm not stopping with this right here because this is, this is, this is not right. They said that Steve didn't clock on on Tuesday, the day that he died. Notice that they came in here on 6-2. You see, this is all management generated on 6-2. They came in here on 6-3 and deleted the clock ring. Why did you have to go in there that day and delete something on the same day Steve died, unless Steve clocked in? Could you answer that question? <laughs> I know what it was. It's to keep from having to pay Wanda because Steve was on the clock because of his death on, on the clock. On, on that, yes. Because mm -hmm, he's on postal time.
I think that they union and management was in it together. I think that they they drove a wedge to Steve, and I think that they left Steve feeling like he just had nothing had left. nothing else to do and no other way out. And I, they they come close to putting that to me. We speak out. We speak out to congressmen. We speak out to all kinds of people, or politicians. You can't get nobody to address it. It's almost like the politicians and the postal services together. I mean, it is. It's almost like it's all all in this one corruption. God said we had to stand up for what was right, and this is right. What we're talking about is right. This is a corruption that's got to stop. And we have to stand up for what is right. We have to. Most people anywhere who are in business today use the mail, whether it's part of their marketing program, part of their communication capabilities. From our perspective as account managers, sales specialists, you say, well, my goal is to, is, is to increase revenue. How can I do that? I went into the marketing department it was a different and a change of pace and a uh, better pay. One of the things that the Postal Service does is they measure everything. Because they can measure mail, you know, how many letters they do per second per machine. And that mindset came over into the sales department. The Postal Service bought a program called Customer First, and they could manage and manipulate numbers for everything. You're going through all sorts of computer systems, scouring for money that the Postal Service already made and already got, and then get it associated with your account. All they cared about was the end big number. It was a lot of work, many, many more hours than we got paid for. You're a salaried employee, but they expect you to work um, your 40 anyway, plus another 20 easy, and many times it was an 80-hour work week. There was a mandate that you bring in $100,000 new revenue every month. Many of my colleagues were reporting 100,000, 500,000, 700,000, uh, a million dollar sales. We started to create this, uh, you know, the, the favoritism, better geographic territories, the better customers, all of the things that would make your job easier if you played the game. And then when all the numbers came out, they said, um, well, how come New York stinks? Look at the rest of the country. Look what they're doing. And we go, what are they doing? They're making up numbers. It's not real. And a lot of people made lots of money <laughs> based on whatever that criteria was. And a lot of the people, like I'll say old post office, kind of like what I call myself, old post office, were going, this is ridiculous. What is all this nonsense? What is all this wasted activity? Well, some people didn't look at it that way. All they saw was a formula for them to get paid. And they immediately jumped in there and started doing that. If you didn't bring in the numbers, your manager didn't get paid either. So your manager had a vested interest in, in getting you to write down what you needed to write down. I started getting in trouble. For the first time in my postal career, I started getting in trouble for not producing what they wanted. And it took me a while to pick up the tricks, um, how you were able to get the numbers that they expected. And little by little, I, I caught on. But after a while, it just felt wrong. <laughs> And every time I talked about it, it's almost like I was growing enemies within. They didn't like the fact that I was bringing up stuff. It was dangerous. And so some people would just outright avoid talking to me because they didn't want to be seen and get in trouble, because um, they would be quizzed or they would have extra duties. When the vice president of sales came to New York because we weren't, like, falling into line, you know, I just went for it. I, I called him onto the side. I said, sir, I know for a fact that there are places where portfolios are being adjusted and manipulated so people become stars and other people are, become losers and are, and are punished. He goes, I never promised you fair. I'm writing all these people and telling them 80% of our USPS income was being manipulated. Yeah, these are, um, actually I just, took these out of the house here and they need to be filed, but they're just papers and documentation, sales that were fabricated. At work, I have, God, so much more than this. And then different files here. I mean, at work, I have huge file cabinets. 
there's no way I would want to keep it all at work because you never know if something would happen. And then some people, you know, they get walked out for very unusual, strange reasons. And so you'd want to definitely have it. It's, I mean, I, I don't think it's being paranoid. It's just being realistic that you're going against a really huge organization and you're trying to make them understand how they've really wronged so many people. Victoria, I'm putting you out on administrative leave pending an investigation into wrongdoing. And she had two policemen with her. So I looked at her and she just walked away. And I asked them, how long, uh, what do I do? He says, get your personal belongings. How long will it take you to ask me? And I said, probably 20 minutes. I've got everything in the office. And they shouted at me, now, lady, now. I, I should have I realized that I was being set up. It took me a long time because I couldn't believe it. I grew up in the Postal Service. Uh, there are rules and regulations. I couldn't believe that my, my colleagues would be so afraid. You shouldn't be afraid. I, I used to tell them because the systems protect you. And what I learned is they, they don't. You can't walk around a corner worrying about, the, you know, they're coming after you for some reason somehow, looking for excuses to, to find you doing something wrong and then punishing you for it and bringing you up on progressive disciplinary action with a view towards removing you from the Postal Service. This is, how can anybody focus on their job? It's almost like assassination, really. The manager that I was telling you about would always want three weeks of appointments for a day scheduled out, yet the people that were the favored didn't have to have that. They were sort of, you know, missing on their calendars. And uh, I believe that that contributed to um, my current health state, that I could have been in a lot better shape had I addressed my health issue that I was not allowed to. Because if you go, if you go out on, um, on, on medical or you you take day sick, you have to make up those visits. So now the four visits you didn't make that day, you got to make them up that week. I have um, never used any sick leave and I've never taken any time off, as you can see from our conversation. So I have enough leave to cover me. The pressure Sue was under proved deadly. By the time she sought treatment, her cancer had taken over. Looking back, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, I would have started complaining earlier and been more forceful about it. Oh, we got some raspberry bushes that we transplanted. If we can get enough berries, we'll make some jam. The biggest complaint that I have is that people can't get a, a grievance filed. It sounds to me like they're not even filing them. Show me the grievance. You know, and that's, and that's what I was doing at the last union meeting. I, I was, show me the grievance. And so the next thing you know, someone in the back starts hauling for uh, the sergeant at arms. Like they need to grab me and, and throw me out of the union meeting because I won't stop complaining that I'm being lied to. Right now, our union is afraid of management. Our union should not be afraid of management. They should not. I hope by the time that this is over that our union is afraid of its members. In March 1970, U.S. postal workers went on strike. It was the first nationwide strike against the government and the largest wildcat strike in history. And we called it a wildcat strike because postal workers went out on strike in opposition to what the union leaders were advising them to do. In several large cities, the post offices are shut down. In New York, for example, the mail system is wholly paralyzed by illegal walkout. The government immediately obtained a court order against the strike, and union leaders ordered the carriers back to work. Many refused. I don't like to go on strike, but we must, because they've been pussyfooting too long. You can't live in New York City on what they're giving you. Prior to the strike, raises were dictated by Congress. Congress said, yeah, we're going to give them a raise. Congress says, no, we're not going to give them a raise. That's what created the strike. I've been told I'm eligible for welfare. 
but I don't want to take welfare. Then. We want to work, but this is the only means we have of letting Congress know that we cannot take it any longer. Either they give us what we should have, or we will stay out on strike until hell freezes over. <laughs> I pulled the Berkeley Heights office out, eight to ten clerks in there. I was a young buck, and I took a chance. Uh, in reality, where everybody that walked the line, I should have been fired. But we took a chance to make it better for everybody else. Well, what if what you're doing is illegal? I don't care. If they want to put me in jail, put me in jail but they haven't got a jail big enough to put all of us in. The strike has spread from coast to coast. Now it directly affects 14 states and has involved about 200,000 postal workers. I have just now directed the activation of the men of the various military organizations to begin in New York City the restoration of essential mail services. Do you think uh, you're doing it as fast as a postal worker? No, I don't. No. He, he must have his own little tricks because I can't find half the spots. What exactly are you doing? I don't really know. <laughs> Finally, Nixon had to give the postal workers what they were asking for. This decision that I have made. Twelve percent pay increase, quicker raises, no penalties for local union leaders. Collective bargaining and binding arbitration. <laughs> And I am grateful for the strikers, because mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the strikers of 1970, we wouldn't be where we are today in the Postal Service. And everybody you know, knows today what happened. We've got the American Postal Workers Union, we've got the Postal Service and a private corporation, semi, uh, and we made out. It put them on a different footing with management, being able to strike this major operation and essentially bring it to its knees. I would say that it wasn't a, a wholesale victory. The forces around Nixon said, make the post office stand on its own two feet and only operate within its own revenues. And so they pulled it out of the post office department, which was a cabinet level department, and put it into a public corporation. They called themselves the Citizens Committee on Postal Reform. They were Standard Oil, Bank of America, Boeing, Coca-Cola, and a host of giant corporations. Their goal was to take the post office out of the hands of Congress and the President, to have it run by a board of governors made up of corporate insiders. In 1970, with workers satisfied by higher pay, they got their wish, and the Postal Reorganization Act became law. The first chairman of the new U.S. Postal Service was Fred Capel, former AT&T CEO. Though the new law begins with the founder's vision for a postal service operated as a basic and fundamental service to bind the nation together, Capel's vision of a corporation with leaders not accountable to the people has proven stronger. Hello and thanks for joining me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the situation that we find ourselves in today in regards to the Postal Service and our entire business. The bottom line is this, we have got to constantly look at what we can do to cut expenses in an attempt to track revenue uh, going forward. And people will say, well, this is a service business. We shouldn't have to worry about that. We are a business. You work in a business. You know, we are no different than any other business out there. As always, thank you for the great job that you do every day, and I'll talk to you next time. The nature of privatization in the U.S. Postal Service is very much hidden from public view. It's privatization from the inside out. So you still see the U.S. Postal Service letter carrier delivering the mail to your door. But all the people involved from getting it from, say, the business in Chicago to your local postal center may not have been postal employees because that whole segment of the U.S. mail stream may have been privatized. What the U.S. Postal Service provides FedEx and UPS is what they call the last mile, uh, which is expensive.
if they had to go the last mile to the destination to deliver. We have Federal Express who drops off parcels. You purchase the item on the internet. You think that you're going through Federal Express because that's the only option you're given on the internet. Federal Express then takes them and drops them off at the post office and we deliver them. They can go and charge someone $10 or $15 or whatever, and then they can go to the post office and get it delivered for $3. There are all these other companies that are also processing parts of the mail and delivering parts of the mail and creating the machines that help to do the sorting. We're seeing private companies doing the work that we used to do. We give them discounts to do the work we're sharing. It's all those people who are behind the scenes sorting the mail, collecting the mail. Pitney Bowes has one of the larger mail house services uh, in, in the country. Uh, they have a variety of business services, many of which are designed to replace the inner workings of the U.S. Postal Service. The Postal Service has spent billions of dollars in investment on equipment that now is underutilized. Much of that work has been contracted out. And so what has been privatized is everything up to that last mile of delivery, because that's where private enterprise can make the biggest profit. They take the profit, and then they leave the costliest aspect public. The way we're contracting out everything, I, I could see that, that the Postal Service will just be a, a, a shell of what it is now. The Postal Service was founded based on a premise to provide a service to all American people, no matter where they live. Universal service. It can't discriminate. It can't say, I don't want to go into the bad parts of the city because there's no money there. Business doesn't do that. It can't do that because it's not profitable. And the Postal Service has the responsibility of delivering to little towns in, in America. That's what we're all about. If we're talking about mail delivery, nobody else does it, and uh, nobody else wants to do it. And as far as remote areas having to pay more, well, you know what, that seems fair to me because, you know, out in Wyoming and other places like that, they pay a lot less for their homes and for their land, so, you know, this would kind of equal everything out. If you were starting a mail company, you would skim the cream off the top. You would deliver to the big cities, You'd only do what is profitable. I'm thinking of the few smaller towns that, that did lose their post offices. And you, you remember back when they were towns? You don't even consider them towns anymore. Despite their costly responsibility of delivering to over 100 million addresses nearly every day, by 2006, the Postal Service was making a billion dollars a year and supporting a trillion dollar mail industry. But it wasn't enough. Right now, the U.S. Postal Service is in the fight of its life Postal to save Service an industry. is in such bad financial shape that it may have to shut down Very this winter. Cash, it's and problem. it's now facing default. A thunderbolt about the future of the U.S. Postal Service. We see some major changes in the Today, operation. The Postal Service is a cash cow. And there was a way to pull money out of the Postal Service to put into the federal, the federal budget. The Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act was signed into law by President George W. Bush in 2006. Under the law, the Postal Service must prepay pension funds in 10 annual installments of over $5.5 billion. No other company does that. No other government agency does that. President Bush, he said he would only sign the bill if the Postal Service recognized that they have a, a liability for the uh, health care costs of their pensioners now and going forward, and that they agreed to fund it over 10 years. Well, most employers have not even recognized that it's a liability, but in order to get him to sign the legislation, we had to agree to that. I think when the president signed the bill in 2007, we thought everything's fine, it's hunky-dory, and a year later, we're in this terrible economic mess as a country. I actually think there was some malice among some individuals involved that wanted to see 
uh, the United States Postal Service as a union environment go away and just privatize the whole thing. I think there was some of that in the mix. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a third quarter, and you're down by 25 points. And if Tom Brady doesn't come in, <laughs> the fact is you're bankrupt. You're beyond bankrupt. Deferred maintenance is about $9 billion. Those vehicles and things, they just have to be restored sooner. The wheels literally will fall off. That tells us, as a businessman, that no matter what they say, they have more than a small cash flow problem. 80% of their costs are human beings. And if you've got too many human beings, you'll build in inefficiency, you'll use labor uh, poorly. Done in by decades of lavish spending, defeated by new technology. Booming last century, it's bleeding money today. It begs for a government bailout. That was a way to make the books of the post office look like they were losing money so you could portray the postal system as inefficiently unprofitable and therefore make the comparison to FedEx and UPS. See, they are profitable, but that's only because you didn't make them do what you made the post office do. It's hustling the public. It's shameful. In spite of the economy tanking, if we hadn't had that payment, the Postal Service would have been one of the few businesses around that actually made money. We would have been hailed as uh, a, a great success. Saddled with a $56 billion demand by the federal government, combined with the biggest financial collapse since the Great Depression, the stage was set for the hustle, the half-truth that would justify the largest downsizing in U.S. history. First-class mail is declining at a rapid pace because people are mailing less. In this information age of emails, tweets, and text messages, what we affectionately call snail mail seems somewhat impractical. The post office is essentially technologically obsolete. I mean, we all have a post office in our pocket. We must create a low-cost, streamlined operational network. They called it network rationalization. It would break apart the infrastructure that kept mail fast, affordable, and reliable. As we consolidate plants, we'll be moving people from one place to another. In some cases, we'll be moving employees from one job to another. Sorry, mail volume's down. Let's excess the whole building. Excess this. Get rid of all of it. I don't care. It's not me. Move them out and tell them to be lucky they got a job. Demonstrations sprung up across the country in 2011 and 12. We don't need no bailout. We want to get the mail out. What they're we doing across no the country bailout. is they're closing postal mail facilities, and one of them here in our valley is Mid Hudson. I think it's very obvious to anybody that's immediately involved the lunacy of sending local mail 100 miles this way or 100 miles that way when you've got the facilities and the equipment and the people right here. The fact that they would take our mail, ship it off to Albany, let them work it, bring it back, and then the trucks would arrive to deliver the mail. It's just a delay of mail service. So I'm not going to talk about the fact that this should be a jewel in your system, the fact that it has a $1 a year lease, the fact that it sits in Stewart Airport, the fact that it's on the crossroads of the Northeast on two major highways. I'm here tonight as a taxpayer, small business owner, and a person who spends thousands of dollars at the post office. You're going to sink the ship completely. All of those people that we deliver to and that we process their mail, they will get it overnight first class. What the Postal Service proposes is changing that overnight service to a two to three day service. The things that we're really concerned with are the elderly, the poor, those that are dependent on their medicines. You know, they're out there and um, they're depending on that mail to be delivered by their carrier. As far as being a letter carrier, it's very personal because I deliver to the route I grew up on. As a mail carrier, I, I deal with these people every day and I don't want to see the service get cut for them. 
I hate to see what the Postal Service does to our customers. They almost treat they almost treat our customers like they don't count, and that's what we're fighting for. We do think they count. You have to pay your bills. You want your bills to get there on time. You don't want to count on waiting a week and a half or two weeks or whatever the heck it's going to take. That's not that's not right. And not everybody owns a computer. Not everybody wants to do their mail over the internet. Not everybody wants to do their banking over the internet. You look at the hacking that's going on. Mm. I rely on the postal service to do my business. The postal service, you're bucking a trend here. Things are, are trying to get more local. And we're talking about getting people to commute an hour and a half in their cars. For me, it's going to be over three hours round trip and then having these trucks go uh, distances. You're also talking about all of that pollutant. Hudson Valley is the most beautiful valley that you could imagine with the river and everything, and it's at a big expense for everybody. They're being told there's no jobs within 50 miles, might be jobs within 100 miles, and then if there's no jobs within 100 miles, they're talking maybe up to 200, 300 miles. They own homes or they live in condos. They got kids in school or kids in college. They can't afford just to pack their bag and move out. We don't want to lose them. They're great people. They're great neighbors. They're lovable. Please don't move away. These people down at that plan give their heart and soul to that damn plan. This job represents for me, I was able to provide my, my children a home a stable family environment. I have a daughter now in college. My two boys are in high school. If I lose this job with the economy the way it is, how can I support my children? If they take our jobs away at the plant, we have no idea where we're gonna be working. It just seems like uh, they're gonna tell us at the last minute and nobody really cares. In all, 223 plants had operations moved elsewhere. The Postal Service is a human organization. With postal managers promising a $1.6 billion savings in two years. After two years and all the disruption, they saved about $91 million, or 5.5% of their imagined goal. The loss of jobs is typical in... Uh in all industries as they're going to automation. The only way to be more efficient uh, is to embrace technology and automation. Today, uh, they got machines that sort so much mail that uh, you blink an eye and they got a truck full already. And what did that mean? That meant less jobs. But if you look at some of the things Amazon is talking about, drones and the like, uh, I think they're looking for a way to cut the middleman out on delivery. Drones, robots, all technological changes are now revolutionizing most of the industries in our economy. So this is a general problem. One solution is, you 50, you're fired. Go home, go on welfare, become a crook, uh, leave the country, whatever. Here's a second way. Everybody works half time. Nobody loses a job. And guess what? Nobody loses any pay, either. Half the work time of everybody there, of 100 people, is now available for their families, for their own development, for their relationships, for the community. That's a benefit for the majority. We don't do that. We do the opposite. We fire 50 of them because that makes profit because the money you don't have to pay those 50 you fired, you, the employer, get to keep. So we allow that profit motive to shape the way technology is instituted in our businesses, public and private. Technology really needs to be used just for the betterment of our lives and not just for, you know, cutting corners, putting people out of work. I mean, I do the math and I say, well, okay, you can keep eliminating jobs because you have now a machine that can do it, but if you take it all the way to the extreme and you just have a couple people working and a whole country with just machines, who's going to buy all the stuff? How can that work? People need to be able to make a living. If delivering mail is not necessary, hey, let's not deliver mail, 
let's do something necessary. Do we need houses? Do we need food? The simple story is that the decline of the U.S. Postal Service uh, coincides with the rise of the internet and email, and that story is just too simplistic. First-class mail volumes have declined, and that has created financial pressure. But if you look at mail volume as a whole, particularly if you look at the parcel segment, they have grown substantially. Looking at internet use, people with more use of the internet or more access to the internet tend to get more mail. The role and influence of private corporations is tremendous, and their ability to shape the legal environment then really reflects their desire to limit competition. If the Postal Service was out of the way, don't you think FedEx and UPS uh, could charge more for what they do? If the Postal Service was out of the way, don't you think the uh, vampires in Congress could uh, sell off all the property and all the assets the Postal Service has and steal that money? All across the United States, we are losing very distinguished buildings and public art that they contain. Major buildings that the Postal Service owned, iconic, beautiful buildings in the centers of town have been sold to real estate developers for not that much money. They were designed to be among the best buildings in town, architecturally distinguished, but also the craftsmanship. Artworks were commissioned for the first time for small rural towns where people had generally never seen art before, let alone public art that depicted themselves and the work that they do and their legends and their history and their landscapes. It was to ennoble Americans who do common work so that they would know that this is part of what constitutes a civilization of all of us working together, doing our bit. The real estate portfolio, which the public owns and paid for, is variously estimated to be worth 50 to $100 billion. So anybody who can get their hands on that is going to make out very nicely, like a bandit, perhaps. The Postal Service gave an exclusive contract to the world's largest commercial real estate company, CBRE, to not only sell our property, but also to advise them on what to sell and also to lease back property which the Postal Service doesn't own to it. So this is a very nice, cushy deal. Now, where it really gets interesting is that the chair of the board and largely the owner of CBRE is none other than Richard C. Blum, a billionaire private equity capitalist who just happens to be the husband of Senator Dianne Feinstein, perhaps the most powerful senator in Congress. By any measure, this is a rather startling conflict of interest that nobody seems to have looked into and the press is scarcely mentioned. In my own city of Santa Monica, I was involved in reforms that transformed that city so that the downtown of Santa Monica became, if not the most, one of the most vibrant retail centers in all of California. And there's a beautiful post office in that set of blocks. And the Postal Service sold it to some guy who's making it into a movie studio. Whereas they could have shared that space, expanded the opportunities so that they would have ongoing revenue uh, and maintain this beautiful location in the middle of town where everybody could go to it. They've moved the post office to someplace on the other side of the freeway where the bus depot is. It's, it's really a crime. That's an area where the Postal Service has not followed my suggestions at all, and I'm quite frustrated about it.
In Washington, D.C., you can go to the old post office and pay the President of the United States $24 for a cheeseburger. Mary Burkhardt, Pacific Branch President of the National Association of Postal Supervisors. Every four years, delegates gather to elect the officers who will represent them in Washington. You need to be assertive, you need to be even a little aggressive, and you have to be unafraid. That was always my expectation. The three officers that we elected, and we're paying almost 150000 a year to. So you think, wow, those are the best of the best. They're fighting, they're 24-7, and, and so, it was always a little disappointing to see that they leave right at five and didn't carry cell phones and didn't even know a lot of the basic rules. We have not elected the right people. When I first ran, one of the national officers told me, why are you doing this? Because it was already the election happened four years ago. He said that all the votes were promised to other people and you don't have anything to run on but your skills. If our whole convention is that corrupt, why even have it? Just dial it in, promise it in. We need someone that's serious, someone that will get it done, someone with the facts behind them, someone that's different. everyone. I better get in or I'll get locked out of my own campaign. Thank you. Yep, the vote's in. We're hoping that Mary will be the new secretary treasurer. For the office of national secretary treasurer, John Jeter, 1,288 votes. Jill Carr, 176 votes. Brian Wagner, 1,593 votes. Mary Burkhardt, 235 votes. Uh, but I'm real disappointed that Mary Burkhardt uh, did not get selected because she was by far uh, the most competent and most caring of, of the candidates uh, that were running. And that's why one day I want one member, one vote, because that's the ultimate way to break this up. Every time I mention it, they're like, we can't have one member, one vote. We can't do that. And I said, why not? And they go, well, because they don't know what they're doing. And I go, but isn't that what the elitists said, you know, in England? And isn't that why we formed this nation? And isn't that why people said in the 1800s? And isn't that why women couldn't vote? Isn't that why black people couldn't vote? And so what we're doing is we're disenfranchising everybody for a few good old boy power brokers. Nothing happens, and it's just a tired organization with a lot of travel expenses. November 2013, the Postal Service begins opening mini post offices in staple stores nationwide. I mean, what's going to happen next? You're going to go to your local post office, there's going to be a sign on the door. We're closed, go to the nearest staple. If it's not a secret deal, give us a contract. I'd like to know what they're getting out of it. The contract has been so redacted that you can hardly read it. took an oath when we were hired to protect their mail. I'm a customer too, so I'm gonna say protect our mail. After three years of pressure, the Postal Service was found in violation of its contract with employees. And Staples closed their postal counters. It's about big business and money. It's not about the public and giving them the service that they deserve. It's not about quality trained workers. It's about money.
One of the things the postal system did was to create the expectation that a job can have reasonable hours, can have a good pension, what used to be called a middle-class American dream lifestyle, right? If you destroy those jobs, what you're doing is you're ratcheting down the standard of living. You're allowing all the other employers in an area to offer less and less so that the only comparison anybody has is the poorer job. What are the costs of low wages? Not just cost to those individual workers, but cost to the communities. The first largest business that employs the most people is Walmart. And the wages there are so low that many of the Walmart employees have to go on welfare. That is, they are subsidized by the taxpayer. And what you end up having is the U.S. Postal Service retail clerk subsidizing Walmart in order to pay those workers so much lower wages. So it really changes the direction of who is subsidizing whom. Traditional nine to five doesn't work in our current uh, economy. As people are working uh, multiple part-time jobs, you may work a four hour a day at the post office and uh, drive Uber for four hours. They've tried to bring in um, hourly wage people for part-time part -time hours um, at $15 an hour with no benefits, no health insurance. Even though they have a ton of uh, employment opportunities, it's hard for them to find people to come and fill the spots. And then the people we do get, sometimes they're, they just don't get it. They think the job is easy, and it's not. It's very physically enduring, you know? This past winter, it was the polar vortex. It was absolutely horrendous. We were working forced overtime. We were working six-day weeks. We were working 12 and 13-hour days. I feel like this in a long time, Paul. This is getting really... It's not fun anymore. I was working on the DPS mail. You got to break it down per loop. The plant just runs it off. You know, we're overburdened. You see yourself staying here until you retire? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not by choice, though. <laughs> like I said, my family needs me. Family needs me. That's what I keep telling myself. My family needs me. Gets me through the day. My wife, three kids. You know, this is America's job. This is for the people. This has existed since the beginning of this country, and there's no reason to stop it. I think letter carriers are the most widely appreciated federal worker in the country. Day to day, when I knock on people's doors and they see me in my postal uniform, they feel like I'm someone they can trust. People do come out in our favor. We have, you know, communities are always back in the letter carriers, all the time. Hey, what's up? Yeah, what, you want to be on TV with me? Our postal workers know our people on the routes. They take pride in being able to make sure that they're okay. We've saved quite a few lives all through the years. Well, I, I did a few emergency breathing. He opened his airway up. I didn't do anything more than anybody else would. Well, yes, you did. He's a hero. I believe this guy just making sure I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, you see something going on in the neighborhood, you report it. You see a fire, they run in and they help people, or they at least warn the people in the area. You think I'm kidding, right? I'm going through the guy's garage. A little perk in the wintertime instead of walking all the way around to the front of the house. That's what you get for after 30 years. In emergencies, in national security situations, if you're going to deliver medicine, or you're going to deliver some antidote, or you're going to deliver some equipment, the post office is the last hope of this country because it doesn't say, well, you know, that's not very profitable. I'm not going to do it. It has a civic obligation as well as a legal obligation to perform on behalf of the American people. You have powers in this country that are trying to choke off the Postal Service and take everything it has that's worth any money. And then you have a group of people that are trying to fulfill the mission 
and to deliver to every address every day, the one philosophy flies in the face of the other. The, the way to do it is not to eliminate a day of delivery. The way to do it is not to uh, eliminate door-to-door -door services, something that we've provided the people all these years. You want to make it like foreign to people. You want to put a box up at the corner and have your mother have to walk a mile to, to get her mail every day. I don't think people want that. I would love to see us go the direction of the self-directed work team, or self-managed team, because we're capable of making the decisions ourselves. Amen. We can put peer pressure on each other to perform. That's right. We can probably achieve better results. If Richard has a problem, I have a problem. And the other people know it, and they have to get on board with that. You know, this has to be an important decision, just like everything else. You got to involve the employees in getting the mail done. When we take ownership, you're not going to recognize the place. Desire, commitment, that's what we want. You only get it when you make people part of the process. We don't need four people doing the same job at four different levels, at four different pay structures. I think there's no one more equipped to run the post office than the people that actually do the work and understand what it takes. Oh, we can definitely run it. In my station, for example, that I come from West Farms, we ran our station. Employees ran our station. You know what your assignment is every day. We can do it all. And most, most of the oversight and the paperwork that the people deal with now is just you know, did the mail get there on time? Did, you know, did that box get there? Did Amazon get all scanned properly? But there's a lot of people in here that uh, are justifying their job, which is a useless job. We have one guy that comes down just to make sure the mail gets here in time. We could check that, you know? Ridiculous. Let the post office be a pioneer again in the days of the Pony Express in the way that it was, but now not about reaching into the far reaches of our country, but rather into the way we organize business. Every post office should be a local workers cooperative, a group of workers whose job it is to make that institution as useful, as helpful to the local community as it knows how to be. Free to do that in any way it sees fit. At one time, they were able to offer copying services in uh, post office lobbies. And <laughs> Kinko's got that shut down. They lobbied Congress. And all of a sudden, there's a law that you can't have copy machines in your local post office. The Postal Service has its hands tied by Congress. For example, up until 1968, you had postal savings system as part of the post office, and the banks didn't like it. Even though people used it, it was convenient, it was reliable, and the banks pressured Congress, they closed it down. You know, people have said, well, let the post office go into banking. Well. You know, that's not why we created the Postal Service. We got plenty of private banks that'll do banking. I think it might diffuse our mission. It might open us up to a lot of criticism. You know, the Postal Service didn't crash the economy and steal people's pensions. The Postal Service is there to provide a service for the people. Unless the banking community has completely abandoned a certain area, and there are some areas that are underbanked, there are only 30 million unbanked people in this country, and they could be the source of wonderful service in communities all over the country, because the most office is there, it doesn't have to be built, and they will produce revenue for the postal service. I think there's a lot of other adaptations that we could be leading the way in, such as a high-speed internet kiosk access to a secure online bill payment center. There's communities all across the country that don't even have access to high-speed internet, period. And there's also many people that can't afford to have these services in their home. The Postal Service doesn't have to pay tax on their uh, building. So if we're going to do that, we've got to find a way to level the playing field so they don't put the mom and pop internet cafe a couple of blocks down out of business. This would be the government competing with the private sector. You betcha, and that's a good thing. Let the private sector have a competitor. To exclude the government means the private sector can do to us, the customers, what it wishes. 
There's no one else who benefits from that, not the public, not the country as a whole, but for the private alternative profit makers, that's why this was done. We understand their frustration about waiting in lines, the short staffing. We want to be the best. We've always strived to be the best, and to see all of what's fallen apart now, it hurts a lot of workers because we have pride. Let them be responsible not only to one another as workers, but to the community they serve. Let there be a board of the community elected democratically that interacts with this worker co-op to reach the decisions that serve this community best. It's a whole new way of organizing. That's right. The post office belongs to us. Yeah. The post office belongs to the American people. Yeah. I want to be able to bring back pride in being a postal worker. I'm proud to be a postal worker. I'm proud to be able to serve the American people. That means something. That means something to me. I definitely want to see a lot of grassroots activism, people getting out there and protecting the United States Postal Service. The letter is so personal. The emails and the texting and all that is all impersonal. And you know how much time and effort it takes to sit down and, and pen something. So it means a lot more. My mom was cleaning out some files and gave me <laughs> that picture, so <laughs> I love it. See, I've been born to do this kind of stuff, see? <laughs> I was doing this way back then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mom, make sure I was ready. She, uh -huh. I guess she planned for me to be somebody. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I got the envelope printed, and inside is a letter from me. I want to continue to do big things for the membership as your chief spokesperson. And that's what I am, a chief spokesperson. That's what union representatives are. We're not lawmakers, so hopefully people don't look at us like some politician. It's a different kind of election, so sent out way more than a 1,000 of them. So the one more year to go with the uh, union, and uh, as I said, I think uh, I'll be able to smile and sleep a little better yeah. and not have nightmares about, you know, who lost their job today or who's getting written up for silly stuff or things like that. Because if you, if you take it personally, which I do, it stays with you uh, in a very negative type of way. Yeah. And really, it, it wears on you. Yeah. You get nostalgic when you come here and you see. Oh, without a doubt, I tell you, is a, a 30 years, half of my life. Bartender's coming. Bartender, even if you want to drink, I'm here an hour. Some of my fondest memories are coming here as a kid, and you letting me sit at the counter, and you know, sell a book of stamps and, and count some change out for the for the customers. Right. I wanted I wanted to show you that you want to treat people like you want to be treated. You treat people like you want to be treated, and I honestly and firmly believe that even though these people were doing business with the Postal Service. They were doing business with me, and after time, they were not customers. They were family and friends. It doesn't take long outside the Maplewood Post Office for my dad to bump into an old customer. Are you being OK? Everything's all right. That's good. I'm out six years already, I can't believe it. I know. That's, <laughs> that's my son and his wife. Oh, how you doing? To how are you? And to today's their first anniversary. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We're making a movie about the post office because of him. Okay. <laughs> he lived in my house and saw it happen, so he was honoring me by making this film. I was fired because I was accused of falsifying a federal document, misappropriation of funds from the Postal Service, which totaled $579.56 over a 10-year period, 13 cents a day. The Postal Service was able to keep me out of work for 364 days without benefit of pay or hospitalization. It was a very trying time in my life. I knew it took a big toll on him, and I was about to go to college, and so he had a mortgage, and you know, I knew he had all these stresses on him, and, and uh, it just didn't seem right. You lose a couple of cases that you feel you should have won, and you feel like your world almost like fell apart. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like a personal kick in the head. It's just uh, not, not acceptable. That's never a good thing when, when you couldn't protect somebody 
There have been a minimal number where they just uh, lost it mentally. They couldn't continue in the job. Uh, others fight and fight and fight and continue fighting. Even though they get ridden up, they fight and they won't back down. But I was so happy that I held out and I was exonerated the day before we were supposed to go to court because management knew they did not have a case against me. Any reasonable subsistence expense that you incur as a result of official travel will be approved. Somehow, some way for my family. My family was at the forefront. My wife, my son, and the place we lived was at the forefront, and they gave me all of my strength. I felt like a boxer who was on the canvas, getting the 10 count. And somehow, God gave me the strength to swing my arms. And I, I hit him, and I won. And I survived. That was a man. And even if at the end of the day, management has to put that worker back to work with full back pay, they will have achieved something in terms of imposing discipline and control on the workforce. I can't make a statement because then they're going to treat me like they treat you. Lo and behold, I did lose my job. He pointed his finger at me, shook at me, said, now you keep eye contact at me when I am talking to you. I'm not afraid of your congressmen or your senators. Go ahead, write them. I mean, you can't get anybody to address it. But workplace change never came from the Postmaster General, whether Megan Brennan or Ben Franklin. Justice, safety, respect. They only ever came in small victories by employees who know their rights and fight for them. I might lose this thing. I might lose everything. There's a big price to pay um, fighting the system, but you have to you have to make a decision that you're going to do it. Uh, and it was my my reputation, my my livelihood. Uh, now I have my job back after three very long years of struggle. I've spent almost twenty thousand dollars on a lawyer. That's something that I may not even get back. It was really wild because he was sitting there going, "I got to be honest. I'm I'm under oath. I got to be honest." And he says, "She's really a good worker." And I'm sitting there going, "Yeah, just keep on being." Honest man, just keep on. Because he turned out to be a better witness for me than he did for them. Tracy won her lawsuit. Today is election day for the uh, union here in Gastonia. I was going to be held at the main post office. Tim Radke is going to run for president. Each candidate is entitled to have an observer present during the following. An observer is in the room with the ballots. They watch the proceedings that are going on, uh, mostly to see that things are done correctly, uh, done the right way, uh, that there are no, uh, per se, shady dealings going on. The people that we want to challenge are the people that have been management once you mm -hmm. go to management, mm -hmm. we don't ever want you back. Of course, I accepted because I want to see that this is done right. And the challenge must be made before those envelopes are opened. Very hopefully, this can be changed, the presidency, uh, to make a new beginning 
um, which the union, I think, needs very much. Well, there's the letter I sent out. <laughs> that, was, that was the only mud I really slung. That's like a poem. Yeah. I didn't vote last year, and this year I want to be the president. <laughs> well, it doesn't take long to... No, it doesn't. And people don't understand why our union does not stand up and speak. I understand why, and most of it has to do with, you know, fear. But the part I don't understand is what they're afraid of. You have another hug. Thank we you. We're at 5 o'clock. Yes, sir. Thank you. You take care of yourself. Thank you. The first thing Steve ever gave me, he uh, was a watch for Christmas, our first year we were married. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be appropriate to wear it tonight. I knew that he would want me to be there. I was there for Steve, what he stood for. I was there for Steve's respect and, and to make things right and to put that spark back into people. I started with the spark and then just keep building it up. And if one, if one person uh, came there, and saw so. you supporting me and changed their vote. One person that that, that was, won the election. That that, that changed from what and, would have and, been and, a tie. And if it was, that's one of the greatest things that could happen. The final vote was 31 to 33. And at one point, I was down by five. Yeah. And I was like, wow. I, I just want to say that I just feel so good about this. We're going to take the presidency in uh, January. Management, ever how high, they expect you to give up. They want you to give up. The way things have been run has stopped people from standing up because they, they would feel that they would be standing alone. Yes. And I hope to uh, spread the message that you're, you're not alone, that uh, so, so go ahead and stand up, and and let's 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 take this on.